This is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Barbara Hensky. This is a podcast for writers to learn more about the craft of writing as we explore a new topic every week. And this week, we are talking about point of view characters, deciding which characters are going to have points of view in your novel. And uh, we're probably going to get kind of specific about what I'm working on and why I raised this topic with Barb in the first place for us to talk about it. So before we jump into that, Barb, what have you got going on? So I am formatting and getting ready to upload probably next week, um, the fourth book in my Guiding Emily series. The title is Down the Aisle, and it'll be available for pre-order and launch on April 6th. So I'm wrangling vellum and software and, you know, uh, I have, usually when I finish writing a book, I write the blurb right away. Somehow I didn't do this on this one. So I've been working on the blurb, which is, I think, always a little slice of, of hell, frankly, is writing that book blurb, but um, I'm wrangling that. So that's what I've got going on. How about you? I also don't love writing blurbs. Although lately, the last couple of books, I have tried to write it, not tried, I have written a blurb before I started writing the novel uh -huh. and and tried to get a log line before I started writing the novel. That's cool. And it will evolve, but it just kind of gives me, because I generally know, <laughs> I generally know where I'm going. Um, and so it just kind of gives me a little bit of a template to strive for. Um, but again, if it changes and it always changes, that's no big deal, but it gives me a starting point. Um, so for better or worse, that's something I've tried. I guess the proof will be in the pudding there, but, um, I don't enjoy it either. Trying to consolidate 70,000 words into what a hundred, hundred and fifty? Yeah, um, is not it's intriguing and hooky, and you know, no spoilers and yada yada. Have you? I know that there are services that will do that. Have you ever tried using a like a, a blurb writing service? You know, I haven't, and I don't really get how that works because by the time I tell them everything they need to know, I may as well have just done it myself you yeah. know I've read plenty of books and articles and things about what should go in your blurb and I have my own opinions now and a blurb for like the fourth book in a series is different than the blurb in the first book nobody's going to just start with you at book four probably although I write them all so that they could be read out of order but still um, so you have to be aware that people have some familiarity or that's my take on it anyway well yeah and the so for my my dark fantasy series the Zaberry chronicles the end of the first book big things happen and so when i went to write the blurb for the second book i had to be very yeah. conscious of yeah. writing it in a way that didn't spoil what happens at the end of the first book. And that was not easy to work around. No, I know how your first book ends. And I know, <laughs> and I was, I was kind of mad at you, but anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I have yeah. a friend that I've been friends with for 20 years now. And I talked to him just yesterday. And so he read the book when it came out in 2021. And he, st every time we talk, he mentions the end of it. And he's like, I'm still not happy about it. I'm like, good. I'm Sorry, dude. You. Yeah. I'm um, I also know of people who have written their blurbs and then dropped it into chat GPT and said, rewrite this in the style of a suspense novel or in the style of a thriller novel or whatever oh, to wow. see what it does with it. And the people that I've talked to who have done that haven't adopted any of those changes wholesale, but it did cause them to think about it differently and consider things that they hadn't considered previously. 
I don't know what this is. What is chat GPT? It is an AI um, function that you can, and I haven't used it extensively, but you can put prompts into it and it will create whatever you ask it to create. So it's a text function. It can, if you ask it to create an outline for a nonfiction book about career change, mm -hmm. and you'd have to be more specific about that, yeah. but then it can give you an outline of what that book might look like or what might be in it. Is this an app or how do you get there? I think if you just Google chat GPT, um, okay. you can find it. It may have, right. There are parts of it that are free. I don't know if there are okay. subscription yeah. versions yeah. of it. Um, but it's an AI function that people are using to augment <laughs> writing and um, just helping. So it's, it's supposed to be really good. I know that some of the lawyers that I'm friends with in an online, like closed lawyer community have tried to get it to give legal advice and it absolutely will not do that. It yeah. is very specific that it good. won't even go there, which is good. It shouldn't. It is good. And medical advice probably shouldn't either. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, we were trying to be really clever and get it to give legal advice and it won't, which is good job by those guys. Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's an option for people who are, you know, like tech savvy. I haven't tried it myself, but um, it might give you ways to think about things that you haven't considered and wouldn't have it. occurred to you. Yeah. Um, I, I apologize if you can hear in the background, the security people are here today and I thought I was getting away from them, from the dogs, which I have, but you can hear in the background, all this ding, ding, ding as they're testing different. I'm sorry. I don't think it's picking up. So I think we're okay oh, right now. Thank God. Okay. Good. Um, so as far as what I've been doing, yeah. I have been really productive in January in working on my fifth novel. I'm writing the 10th chapter now. I've been trying to keep, I keep talking about this interview we did with David Ellis, um, mm -hmm. where he talked a lot about reader attention and keeping cha chapters around 1200 words. And I'm on the 10th chapter. And so far, all of them have been 11 to 1300 words. Yeah. Which is way more consistent than I have been with any of the others. Um, so I'm finding a natural cutoff point. I'm not creating some, an mm -hmm. artificial place to end. It's got to feel right. Um, yeah. But I have found a place kind of in that range with every chapter so far. Yeah. So I've, we'll been following, I've been trying to follow his advice too, because I thought it was really spot on. Yeah. I and mean, if I could sell 170 million books like James Patterson doing yeah. that, then we'll be good. Yeah, I'd be um, happy to have that. That's exactly right. I'm sure that's all it takes is the 1200 word chapters. Yeah. So yeah, point of view. This, this fifth book has a bigger cast than I have dealt with before. Um, it's the group of people that are, and the book starts out, it's a group of people who are in a private jet going from South America back to uh, the United States and they crash over the Caribbean. And so you have this, this group and they're together and they're together a lot, which is not something that I have dealt with before. Usually I try and get my folks paired off into smaller groups aside from, you know, there are going to be times where you have a bigger group, but I'm way more comfortable with two, three, maybe even four people. Um, but with this book, you've got people on a small plane and then on an island and there's not a lot of places to go. And so they're just together a lot. When I started writing it, I thought, and, and so the, the tagline that I've come up with is, and I think I mentioned on here, this is going to be a book that is a cross between Castaway and 
Agatha Christie's, and then there were none. So you got wow. these people who yeah. have crashed on an island, and then folks start disappearing. And there's not there's not a lot of options of who who could be behind it or what could be happening. Um, and so anyway, the, the tagline that I came up with today. Now I need to open my Word document so I can read it and not get it wrong. Is uh, they survived a plane crash only to disappear on a deserted island. I love and that. So we've got we've got these eight folks who are survivors and they're together. And I thought when I started writing it that I would have multiple points of view. And I would just have different, maybe two, three characters who I would rotate between to tell this story. But then as I started writing it, I thought, well, if I have several characters whose perspectives I'm writing from and we are trying to figure out whether these people are being killed or what's happening to them and what's going on, it might seem artificial to the reader about whose perspective I'm telling it through when somebody else who's a point of view character could know more. Like I am... Mm -hmm intentionally being deceit deceitful is probably not the right word but withholding information by the perspective that i'm choosing to tell it from and i didn't want that so i have narrowed it down to the one person who's going to tell this story um i've started writing it from a third person free and direct mm -hmm. style because that's what i'm comfortable with that's what i wrote the first three novels in the fourth novel was first person and this one now that it's one person i am trying to figure out whether i'm going to be better served if it's first person or third person and i i haven't settled on anything i'm getting to the point where 10 chapters in ten thousand words in I need to figure it out because it's going to be a bear to try and rewrite it in a different perspective oh, yeah. if I have to. Yeah. Uh, but that's something I've really been contending with a lot in this first you know, quarter of the book. Let me ask you. So is, yeah, you know, if you were trying to do it from multiple POV characters, then, you know, you, I've seen that writers will do that. And at the beginning of the chapter, they'll say John or Mary or whoever it is. And that does get to be for the reader and particularly in audio, it gets to be a little, unless there's a different audio voice, it gets to be a little confusing to keep mm -hmm. track of. So I like the one voice. I think if you write one voice first, well, is the one voice the killer? I don't think so. I don't okay. know who the killer is yet. Yeah. Well, that's um, always, but I, I don't, ex it, yeah. I well, don't expect it to be at this point. Okay, because if it's the killer, then the reader, then you're going to have to lie to the reader with, with and cover some stuff up. So that is never very attractive. But I think it's easier to hide the ball third person than it is first person. But maybe you don't want to hide the ball. First person gives you such immediacy. I mean, yeah, you're writing a very complex story. For sure. Well, and it is going differently in, than I expected. Um, and I think I mentioned this maybe in the last episode in the opening that when I first started it, I thought it was going to going to be a short story or a novella. I'm, you know, I, I mentioned I'm 10,000 words in and we're only like 36 hours into this adventure. Yeah. which is a much shorter period of time than any of the other books have transpired in, like up to this mm -hmm. point. Uh, because it turns out when you have a plane crash, um, it takes a long time. You know, they're, they start off up in the air. Then you have all these events occur. Then the folks who make it are on the island and trying to figure out what to do. And you've got to get through all of that before you can even in, get into Okay, yeah. now folks are disappearing. And yeah. so I've also decided that, you know, I'd been talking th about this as 
a murder mystery kind of book. But mm-hmm. I think that it's going to get take so long to get into that part of it that I don't think I can call it that because it's going to set up a false expectation of of what it is. I think I'm probably going to have to call it mm-hmm. a suspense novel, um, yeah. which I think will be more accurate and set up a different expectation than that very specific murder mystery genre. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to have that component of it, but I don't think we're going to get into that until, I mean, obviously we're not going to get into it until later. Yeah. Um, and so I don't remember if I answered your question. Oh, we, you mentioned about the immediacy of first person and third yeah. person. So I think with that one character who I do not expect to be the killer, because that's not the story that I envisioned telling. Mm-hmm. Um having it just that one person prevents that hiding the ball because you would have to do it. And so the reader is only going, whether it's first person or third person, they are only going to experience the story from what this particular character knows. Okay. Um, And so I think that's a benefit. It helps. Mm -hmm. It helps with the suspense. Because yes. they're only going to know what she knows. And and it's female. Um, and so I, th- I just have to figure out. And, and some people have an aversion to first person. Like I, I have just finished reading a fantasy novel just this morning. When I say reading, listening to an audio book. Because yeah. some people want the distinction there. Um of the black tongue thief it's a fantasy novel and it is written in first person my brother-in-law is also reading it um, and mentioned that it took him a minute to get into it because Mm -hmm. it's just such a different perspective than what he's accustomed to and so i don't want to create a barrier uh, to people who wouldn't be expecting it in this genre but I think suspense novels, there's a mix of first and third. There, there are a mix. Yeah. I, I myself, I'm not a big fan of first person, although I do write one first person character in one of my series. Um, but you, yeah, you've got it in that, in the suspense genre. One thing you could do if you need to throw in some suspense and a little darkness or something, you could throw in the odd short chapter from the first person of the killer, which you know who they are. And you could sprinkle a little of that pixie dust throughout if you wanted to add the creepiness factor. But I do like the idea of someone who's there and observing, having that main character that whether she's first person or third, you can have the reader really like, I assume they're gonna like and root for this person. I hope so. Yeah, because Uh, readers like a character to root for. Yeah. And what you just mentioned about writing from the killer's perspective, in my second novel, um, Seeking Sanctuary, it is, it's fantasy. It's a tie-in to the first one, Vulcan Rising, but it's a serial killer book. And I did write a couple of those chapters. I think it probably ended up being three or four chapters from the killer's perspective Mm -hmm. uh, because I wanted to establish his motivations and tell parts of the story that there wasn't any other way to experience. So I've done that before. I think that it, it worked really well. Um, One of those was a, a scene where he was killing somebody during, you know, the course of the chapter. And I thought that it was going to be fun to write that because it was so different from anything else. Um, But man, about halfway or two thirds of the way through that I was, and it was kind of rough. Like it's, it's a grisly chapter. And by the time I was done with that, like I just felt unclean. Like I I needed to go take a shower. um, And I did not want to do that. You know, that is, isn't that interesting? Um, I've written two suspense murder mystery kinds of things. One's a serial killer, one's not. Um, My book, Deadly Parcel, 
starts with the killer, a like microscopic, really on the killer dismembering a body because this killer then mails body parts mm. to a select group of people. And that's kind of how the book starts. And I'm like, oh, I hate this. And working with my editor is like, no, close up, close up, you know, knife on the flesh. So I got through it. It was awful to write, but I have, but generally I write sweet Christmas in women's fiction, clean women's fiction. So I had a number of my writer or my loyal readers say, I, I couldn't even get through the first chapter. And I felt bad about that. Um, but just recently that particular book is kind of found an audience. So mm. that's been nice, but I understand writing the scenes. I don't like writing those. I also don't like really writing romance scenes. You know, I don't write um, erotic scenes. I don't write spicy scenes, but uh, it just kind of, I don't know, bores me. Isn't that an awful thing to say? But no, I mean, I I've only had, you know, mine have all been fantasy action books. Um, but anytime we get there, I'm, I'm just cutting to black and like, you can fill in the gap. Like we're just going to move absolutely, on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, that, that writer's technique of putting in another point of view character is really a helpful technique in a book, whether you want to make it darker or lighten it. In my Guiding Emily series, I especially the first book, I have a young woman who loses her eyesight on her honeymoon and her descent into despair and depression. And then as she climbs back out, but that would be a really heavy, heavy book um, without the other character point of view character which is first person and that's her guide dog which mm. the beginning of the book it's a guide dog a puppy in training so it's cute and it's funny and it's ironic and his little journey to becoming a guide dog and then they're coming together and then in the later books his observations lighten the mood a little mm -hmm. bit which i think has helped this particular series find find an audience and just not be one of my concerns in writing this book was I had a lot of input from the blind visually impaired community and they all said we don't we want to be seen as capable and competent we don't want people feeling sorry for us we don't want this to be all uh oh poor little blind girl kind of book so um I was able to do that and help that with with Garth coming along. So it's interesting how you can use point of views, just not just for information, but for mood. I I hadn't thought about that before, but I will continue to think about that. Of that can be a very effective purpose of of choosing a a point of view character is is for mood. Um, yeah. And that you made me think that, of you may use that in this one. Yeah. Find that's helpful. Um, do you remember, it was probably 10 or 15 years ago now, a movie called Crash um, yes. set in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And a lot of it had to do with race right. relations and police. Yeah. And when I left that movie, it was so heavy. The entire yeah. movie. I mean, that was its purpose. And I understand that. And yeah. that, you know, it's a heavy topic. But I felt like I needed some moments of lightness or levity mm -hmm. somewhere along the way to just like, yeah, give me a minute to collect myself. Yeah. Um, and which sounds like, you know, for you in guiding Emily, that was Garth. He was yes. able to give you that moment or those yes. moments of, Hey, here's something else. Yeah. Yeah, some hopefulness, um, which is what the whole series is about. I haven't thought about Crash in years, but I should go back and watch that now from a writer's perspective because I remember it being very fast paced. But that's the other thing. Any book that is just constantly fast paced is exhausting to read too. Mm -hmm. We all get a little high and then just, okay, let's back it off a little bit and take a breath. That's what the best storytellers do. Oral story yeah. yeah. And I try to be cognizant of that too, because I don't love writing action, like, like mm -hmm. fight sequences or anything like that. Yeah. I don't think it's particularly interesting in itself. There needs to be something else that's happening there. 
Um, but, and some people enjoy writing it. Some people enjoy reading it. I'm not one of those people, but they are, can be essential. And so, you know, when those things happen, I'm not having just like a punch by punch, you know, (laughs) writing through it. Um, but the pacing is important and you've got to keep the, you know, enough white space and all of that, but then either both before it and after it, I want to have enough of a slowdown that we, you know, I don't want you to be tired of it. The same thing with Mm -hmm. writing those darker scenes, like you mentioned, like when things are really grim, I want to write enough that you experience and understand what's happening and feel what's happening, but not so much that you get bored of it. Like when you have horror and shock, Mm -hmm. you got to have enough, but not so much that it just becomes blase. You know, yes. And different people have different levels of that. I know my husband loves, you know, action adventure movies, which I despise. And there are times in like the Mission Impossibles and all that at the end and the car chases and even in the French Connection, that very iconic movie. And there's that car chase. I'm like, all right, roll this up. Um, it just goes on too long. And at some point you're like, okay, would you please just somebody die, somebody crash. I'm, I'm done with this. Um, it's so interesting. I watch a lot of Acorn and Britbox British crime drama because the Brits just love their mm-hmm. true crime stuff or their crime dramas. And it's interesting to see how they pull back on that. And some of it can be very dark, um, but it's interesting how they can use a little lightness, a little humor in what is typically a very dark uh, plot arc. Do you watch Luther? I haven't. Okay. Luther I is haven't. with Idris Elba. He's a, a detective, is British. Um, and it's very dark, but one of the, well, I can't even talk about what I was going to mention, but they do an affair, uh, an effective job of having characters who change the pace um, based on what they bring to the screen. Mm-hmm. I think there's only five seasons. I think they're going to make a movie of it. Interesting. It's, it's dark, but it's one of the best shows. Oh yeah. Going. It's true. So definitely worthwhile if you can figure out where it's streaming and i don't know where it's streaming right now because all those things change so frequently yeah um so when you're writing like your your rosemont series which has been going on for is it nine books now yeah i'm just going to be publishing the ninth book okay yeah and you've got a lot of folks how Mm -hmm. do you how do you decide who's getting a perspective yeah. Um, well, I write from third person, so that's made it a little easier. Um, but then who's going to be the, who's going to have a plot arc? Um, I envisioned this as a five book series. And so I wrapped it up in book five and, you know, uh, bringing them home. It was the HEA. We're all good. And I had so many people clamoring for more. And my assistant said, what is wrong with you? People want to buy these books. Why don't you buy them? And I thought, you know, that's a darn good point. So I gave the main character a different job because I hate those that just keep going on and on and on and on. Got to have some character growth. So she had a new job and um, my main bad guy who had a very strong redemptive character arc. This ninth book is kind of more of his story. So I've decided that if I continue, and I think I will continue this, I'm going to, the main character, my original main character has to be in everything. But other than that, I'm just going to showcase different characters. And I do include in the back of every book a recurring character list because it's hard to keep track of them all. And it's hard for me to keep track of them. Um, Do you have any documents internally that are like your purposes only where you keep track of all that? Oh, absolutely. I have a big character Bible that I kept on Word. I know that um, I use Plotter and now they're touting their um, their character Bible series. I haven't been all that, frankly, uh, 
please with Plotter. It gets glitchy at times. So I don't know if I'm willing to really invest the time and effort to move everything there. But I do keep track of that because it just gets to be too much when you write series um, and naming characters. I mean, in Guiding Emily, Garth is the guide dog and her love interest is Grant. What was I thinking? <laughs> And even proofreaders and editors don't catch those things. I mean, I write clean romance, but, or clean uh, women's fiction. And, you know, Garth has to be in a working harness. He's a guide dog. But in one chapter I had Grant, she put Grant in his working harness. And it's like, okay, no, no, no. This is, this is not what we're writing. And this went through <laughs> the, the final edits. And I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot. So I am an advocate of character Bibles. Yeah, even in this book that I'm writing now, I have already changed people's names because I thought that they sounded, they just had too many of similar sounds. And I don't yeah. like that. Um, no, and, and if you're doing an audio book, make sure that their names that sound okay. There's a women's fiction writer who wrote a character whose nickname was Boop. Mm. All right. It is so annoying to listen to this in audio. Boop, boop, boop. I mean, can you imagine listening to that over and over again? Yeah. I And she was traditionally published and they put a lot of money behind it. So I can't believe somebody didn't say, you know, um, in their marketing department didn't say, I think we need to make it a little fine to replace all with this name, this nickname. Well, and as prevalent uh, and as large a market share as audiobooks are now, yeah. that really does, that's something you've got to pay pay attention to. Yes. Yeah. And I'm an audiobook listener and I, I think I'm paying attention, but I'm getting, I'm getting dressed in the morning. So I am doing other things. If you're driving to work, you are, you're not paying the same kind of attention. So you better have your main characters better not be, um, Sam, Sal, you know, Sid, people are going to be confused as to who's doing what. Yeah. And another thing that's really affected for me because I am a big audiobook consumer is dialogue text. And if you oh, have yeah. said too many times, um, I mean, I don't use a lot, I'm minimal about dialogue tags anyway. But when you're listening to that, because when you're reading the text, it it's ba background noise. Like you don't even notice it. Right, yeah. But when you're listening to it, it's unavoidable. And if it's repetitive, it's obnoxious. And so I try to be cognizant of that. You know, that's a very good point. And I hadn't thought about it from the audio standpoint, because of course the conventional wisdom is just use said it disappears on the page and don't use things like, you know, she sighed because... Well, get over yourself. It makes it a little more, you know, um, listenable if you just mm -hmm. change up your your tags a little bit. Um, that's a great tip. Well, let's leave off there. Um, I think that's a good place to end with something really practical. And we have our next few interviews are all going to be or our next few episodes are all going to be interviews so i am looking forward to those we've got some really good stuff lined up so i know yeah. that we almost always forget to ask people to leave a rating and review um please do that it, it helps the algorithms uh helps you know apple podcasts or whoever you're listening through figure out what shows people enjoy and to promote those so thank you for listening help us out by rating subscribing if you're watching on youtube leave a like there leave a comment um and we look forward to talking to you again soon absolutely take care everybody